All right, we're gonna wait for a couple of folks to get in. So probably five, five after, and then we'll start the party arena. Uh, you know, I'm excited to chat with you today. It's all about burnout, right? It's always about burnout. <laughs> you know it, you know it. Of course, I'm like, we live in the same world. Um, so it's definitely about it. I, um, as you hear, like, it's been an interesting journey over the past five years, like to go from a space where I talk about it. And people are like, what, what, what are you making up? Like this yeah, is what a timely business you have, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, very timely working to capitalize on it while also balancing my own versions of it. Um, that's the fun part about working in this space is that it's so close to my heart and I'm human as well. So, um, I have to live exactly what I preach, which I mean, that's pretty awesome. Talk about yeah. testimony. We got some people pulling in here too. Um, I see some new faces in here, or I have sweet some new names with some returning. You know, shout out to the TSC team. Uh, jump, I see you here, Caroline. Here you see you here, Haley. What's up, Heather? Um, so this is what we're gonna do, y'all. If it's your first time in a TSC webinar, go ahead and post in the chat, please. Uh, if you're a returner, uh, go ahead and post in the chat as well. Let's get this chat lit up because we're gonna engage with the chat room today. I am so excited to introduce you to my friend, Arena, who I met at the Forbes Under 30 conference, right? Like, how, how did we meet each other again? We, did we just like bump into each other or? Oh, that's funny. No, uh, you were my hookup, Kenny. Um, it was Orchid's intro. It was Orchid's intro. We we oh, we gotta send this to her. Yes, Orchid is amazing. Um, she is due any day unless she had a baby in the past couple of days, but yeah, so. She might be out of commission right now, but definitely keeping her in the loop there. Yeah, no, that's awesome. She, what, a, what an awesome connector. Uh, yeah, she is. All right, we're gonna give but up. As are you, I, it's just part of your DNA. That's what you do. So I think birds of a fly, feather flock together. Hey, you know, I think awesome people should meet awesome people. Yes. All right, when y'all do uh, send messages in the chat room too, uh, please make sure you, uh, if you want to direct it to everyone, go ahead and press everyone. Oh, if it's Kenny, just a... it says chat's disabled. Oh, no way, really? Womp womp, yes. Uh, See, people are just so excited to get in there. Dang. That's a shame. Chat should never be disabled here. Um, what we can do here then is if y'all have any questions here, go ahead and post it in the Q&A. Oh, I um, might have just changed it. Let's see. Can someone test? Yeah, it works. There you go. Bam. What's up, Darian? Congratulations on breaking the ice, Darian. What's up, Tracy? Glad to be here. Woo, Tracy, glad we kicked off the project recently, right? What's up, Coy? Diana, what's up, Kristen? Woo, Kristen's in the house. She's a former uh, TC webinar speaker. I love seeing alumni here. That gets me so excited. And what's up, Haley? Our very own Haley Johnson in the house. All right. So I think I'm going to give us one, one more minute then, Arena. I guess we get the party started then. So, all right, while we wait, I'm just going to go ahead and talk to you about some of the ground rules whenever we do get together and chat. Um, one of the first things that we always say is that if you like the music, just look up TSC Workplace Jams on Spotify. You can you can uh, pick some of this up. Also, on top of that, if you want to know, like, what are the values that we hold dear for these webinars? First one is be present. I know you can open email, Slack, or text messages, or that cat video is waiting in YouTube. Please turn that off. Like, we really do value all eyes on here because there are chances to engage because you do learn a lot from your fellow uh, participants in the chat room and also from our webinar uh, hosts and also not just me, but of course, Arena as well. The reason why we're all here today. And then finally, do the 72 hour to do's. You know, at the end of this challenge or at the end of this webinar, you're going to have some to do's that you can take away immediately. We do believe that at the end of webinars, what makes them great is our philosophy of making them to-dos versus takeaways. It actually gives you actions to follow up on. And if you're looking for like previous webinars we've done, you can just go to tsc368.com slash webinars, and you can see some past webinars we've done here. We've done a, we've done a few so far, y'all. And it's been really exciting with our last one being the state of flow state, uh, which was such a great conversation about how do you get in the zone? And everyone in the chat kept asking about a burnout session. And I knew, of course, I had to ring Arena because she's one of the best there is on it. And so it only makes sense that we follow up with Arena here, who is the founder of Hookie Wellness. So I'll read her bio here that'll give you the official Kenny introduction. Arena Sargent is a speaker, 
mental wellness champion and burnout expert, specializing in empowering high performance professionals to lead themselves and their teams through burnout. As founder and chief anti-burnout champion, Hookie Wellness, she merged employee-centric design and mental wellness to develop their comprehensive burnout relief system, Navigating Burnout. She has armed thousands of professionals with a deep awareness of burnout and a biased reaction across clients, including Google, Deloitte, Microsoft, LinkedIn, Indiana University, UNCF, and Teach for America. Before Hookie Wellness, Arena built a 16-year career as a brand and innovation leader across the workspace, workspace design, consumer goods, and tech industries, working at leading companies including Nestle, Haworth, and Intuit. Basically, what that means is she knows what burnouts feel like, feels like, and she's not just an academia person. She's someone that's actually lived it, can talk to you about it, and can make you feel better about it. So, Arena, I'm so excited to have you today. I'm going to give you the digital mic now. And y'all, for those that y'all didn't hear, we, we met a couple of years ago at a conference. And when she told me about how she was jumping into the burnout world, I knew she was onto something. But after that, the pandemic happened. And that's when I knew that, oh, geez, she's going to take off and take off that she did. And that's why I'm so excited to have her here. So, Arena, you can take it away from here. Thank you so much. Uh, always exciting to talk with you um, and to be a part of this community. Your conversations and the people you know are just all dope. So uh, that would include everyone on today's call. So excited to be a part of this community. And as you said, to have a wonderful candid conversation about my favorite topic, I guess, burnout. Um, and as you can see, uh, been there, done that, made the shirts. That's literally what I do. So uh, today's conversation is going to be all about debunking burnout. There's a lot of conversation now. It's all of a sudden a headline um, and top of mind for everyone, but I'd like to bring a different approach and how can we think about it differently? So we're getting into debunking. There's three key areas, but I'll also give a little bit of uh, information and education to make sure we're all on the same page. Sound good? All right. If everyone's ready to talk about burnout today, can you put in the chat? Let's go. Let's go. All right. Let's go. Oh, oh, I LFG. Like Let's go. Stuff. I told you the crowd's great. I'm like, is that, that must yeah. be, that's Louisiana. Is that my guess, right? Is that a real No, guess? there's people all over. That, that's just the crowd that we bring in. That's why I'm, I'm, I take a sense of pride of who attends our webinars because they're, they're very engaged, as you can tell right here. Oh, I was looking at how Tim and Nikki spell go. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a dead giveaway. I think so. I love it. All right. So I'm definitely at MBA, so you will always um, see slides from me. Um, if you can see my slides, can you give me a thumbs up? Uh, Kenny, I can see your face. You got a thumbs up? All right. As I said, we're talking about debunking burnout and how rethinking the approach is the key to beating it in the workplace. So Kenny gave you a little bit of overview about who I am. If you follow me on social media or if you'd like to, I am the burnout whisperer, uh, the original. Um, I am, as you said, Hookie Wellness founder and chief anti-burnout champion. Um, when you look at my career beyond my resume, uh, I break it down into three chapters. Uh, I am a bookworm, always have been, so why not? Uh, the first chapter is uh, Detroit Hustles Harder. I am from Detroit, blue collar upbringing, where I was uh, deeply ingrained with the idea of working harder and grinding and hustling. So once I could have a job, I had three. Uh, so the idea of doing the most uh, is very familiar to me, um, hustle culture near and dear. The next chapter, as I progressed through my career after getting my degrees uh, in my MBA at Indiana University, working in workspace design, working in consumer goods, as well as the tech industry, about five years ago, I had a wonderful opportunity, development opportunity, let's say, to experience burnout firsthand. Um, and I was blindsided by it. It was an experience where it started as a great opportunity and just turned into life lifing. Um, so my uh, experience really started uh, with, my experience really started with more of a toxic work environment, but that is not uh, a, a need for burnout to exist. And so it was the first time I'd experienced a time where working harder was no longer working. And I was like, what in the world is this? That is what I know how to do. You grind and you work your way through it. And so that is how I started to really deep dive into the world of burnout, understanding mental health and wellness, and becoming very clear that the very solutions and tools that are set up to support us are very friction filled and can add more stress rather than alleviating the stress. 
that was also how I started to understand how it was consuming those around me. And once again, this was five years ago. So when you look at studies in uh, Deloitte study, actually before the epidemic pandemic, 77% of professionals were reporting feeling burned out. This is not new. We just started talking about it. I just happened to be one of the lucky ones on the front end of that. Um, and so in that experience of experiencing burnout, life lifing and having to figure it out, that is how I found my way and pivot into entrepreneurship. And I jokingly say, but seriously say, my therapist put me on timeout. That is how I had to start really understanding and embracing the power of breaks and of playing hooky more often, i.e. my company name. Um, my therapist literally put me on time out. I had decided to take leave for a couple of weeks um, as I was dealing with the aging ailing parent on top of this internal shift. Um, and in that first week I went into session and she's like, how's it going? And I told her the truth that I had put down my day job laptop and picked up my hooky laptop. And she said, that's not what we're here for. Um, the, a break is for a break. And so from 12 to five, at least three days out of the week, she said, I could not work. That was so jarring. That was so unfamiliar. What do you mean I cannot work? I have to slow down. And in those moments, that was exactly where I, I reconnected with myself sitting by a pool, reading books, reading magazines that had been stacked, piling up, but I had no mental space and didn't feel like I had enough time to do it. It is when I started reconnecting with some friends and creating ladies who brunch on, um, during the week. We were all going through this transition in life and we started going to the museum on Tuesdays or going and experiencing new areas in town that we hadn't visited. It was in those moments that I realized, oh, this is exactly what my body and my brain needs so that I can move forward, so that I can heal, so that I can actually mitigate the symptoms of burnout that impact us each and every day. Uh, so as Kenny said, I've spent the past few years really supporting workplace teams um, and organizations. I also have a column in Well and Good uh, where I tackle some of those real-time questions about working wellness is like I call it. Um, so you can always read any of those articles, but that's a little bit more about me, how I got into the work that I do and how I became the burnout whisperer and the chief anti-burnout champion. So how do we get here? Passion led us here. Um, has anyone ever used a GPS system to get somewhere? Just put in the chat, yes. If you've ever used a GPS, I don't think I'm aging us. You can even say MapQuest, like even a MapQuest. Um, okay, so yes, can't live without it. I am also one of those. I use my GPS to go to places I've been 50 times, just in case. So Okay, when you have a GPS, this I would imagine this is somewhat of a familiar feeling. Imagine that you are going to a very important meeting. You have prepped, you have done all of your pre-work, you have your slides done, you, are, um, you have practiced, you've practiced Q&A, you got your backup slides, you're like, all right, I am on it, I am ready to go. You look good, you, you, you did your, your power stance, and then you hit the road, you put it in your GPS, and you're like, awesome, I will get there 25 minutes early, plenty of time, I can breathe, uh, and I am set for success. And then you start driving and you get about 10 minutes away and you're all of a sudden in a downtown and you're like, okay, oh, look at the nice building. And you're at a light and then you just realize that, oh, wait a minute, my GPS told me to turn left, but now all of a sudden it's telling me to turn right at this block. Oh, but wait a minute, no, is it? Is it telling me to go around the block and then come back and then to make another right, your GPS goes haywire, like in the middle of a downtown, in the middle of traffic, just goes awry. Has any that happened to anyone? If so, put that in the chat. Yes, that happened to me. Um, so you are that person darting back and forth across traffic because your GPS all of a sudden is going haywire, but you knew where you were going, right? That is what happens with burnout with a lot of these high-performance professionals, of course, is that you know where you're going, you did your pre-work, you, you did all of the training, you went to all the classes, you even did the extra credit, but all of a sudden you were on a road and you knew where you were going and you were even ahead of the pack, but now you're just completely thrown off. How does this happen? And yes, Heather, peak anxiety moment, because no one wants to be hunked at, and then all of a sudden, all of that pre preparedness seems like it is all for naught. But what's really interesting, if you think about it, if, if you have an idea of where you're going, even if your GPS gets a little bit wonky, which sometimes it will, 
because it's out of your control, honestly, then you can still find your way there. That's my approach and how I like to think about burnout is that there will be times in your life where that GPS just goes off, off the hook. It could be because you're in the middle of a new city that you've never been in. It could be in the middle of a situation where there's construction and now your GPS doesn't know where to go. There could be many outside things that could be doing it, or you could even put in the wrong address potentially. But there are things that will happen in life where your GPS will go off. But if you have an idea and the preparedness of what can I do if that happens, you could still get there on time. You might get there only five minutes early. And honestly, you might get there just in time, you might even be a little bit late, but you can breathe through it. And it's like, ha, 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 you never would have thought what happened. That is what happens with burnout. And the thing is, if you have an idea of what is going on, you can create a preparedness so that you can work around whatever life may throw your way. So we are at this place where passion has led us here. And so it's a matter of how can we know enough so that we can work around whatever life throws our way. So as I said, I like to give a little bit of education just to uh, get us on the same page. So when you think about burnout from a technical definition, it is a state of emotional, physical, and mental exhaustion that is caused by excessive and prolonged unmanaged stress. I like to start with the definition because right now, all of a sudden everyone's talking about burnout, but there's a lot of sugar coating and greenwashing in the space. There's a couple of things specifically I like to point out is that one is that burnout is multifaceted. It is emotional, physical, and mental. It is not just being tired. That, that is not the same thing. The other thing is that it is caused by excessive and prolonged unmanaged stress. It is a result of untreated stress. It is not something that just pops up out of the blue, but is a result of a longer term situation. And so I use this chart because I like people to um, understand the stress curve. Uh, this was something that one of my therapist partners actually introduced me to and it, it opened my mind. So this is truly like the stress curve. And when you look at it, the first thing is, wait, all stress isn't the same? No, it is not. And also burnout and stress are not the same thing. As you'll see, burnout is on the tail end of it and it creates its own cycle, which we'll talk about. But stress in itself has different levels of it. And there's actually optimum stress, which is where most people function, and especially those performers um, who are, are looking to push themselves and learn and grow. So that is what that space is. It's where you're pushed to develop, to learn new skills, uh, to, to build and develop and to grow. That orange section is where it starts to become too much stress or overload, where that's honestly where most of our culture folk, uh, functions for the, for the most time. The thing is that we often don't recognize that those are two different things. And what we really didn't recognize is that there's this whole other gamut called burnout that can happen if you haven't identified what are some of those symptoms, signs, and warning flags in your life of getting too much stress. And I am a very uh, candid, <coughs> transparent when it comes to this space and being very realistic. That orange is not avoidable. If you are in high performance environments, if you are one that is uh, always looking to improve or to grow or to build your career, that is where you'll be a large part of the time. The big thing and the most important thing is to recognize your symptoms and signs of when you are beyond your average or your manageable level of stress. And what I can tell you is you've been there over the past three years because it's the same three years we've all been living in it. And that is how we ended up where we are today is that all of our coping mechanisms were eliminated. And there was a lack of self-awareness in this space of recognizing things are not the same. So I always like to point this out so, so we can just remind ourselves that all stress is not equal and stress and burnout are not the same. So when you get into a point of burnout, it is an intensifying cycle that warns you something's off with your situation. It is not a sign of failure, which is a very common language that I hear from clients. It is something is off with your situation. And there are three big dimensions that have been proven to be affected. So exhaustion is a big one. That is very clear. It's one of the first signs. Cynicism uh, and a negative emotion around the things regarding life. And then your professional efficacy is impacted. That is towards the, the tail end of it, but uh, which it can be quite severe and cause cognitive fog. Um, but even in the earlier stages where you, you'll often find that you're working more but producing less. So those are three proven dimensions. And small caveat, I focus on workplace burnout. 
Burnout has many faces of it. There's caregiver burnout, parental burnout, relationship burnout, workplace burnout gets most of the airtime. Uh, and especially in that work takes up so much of our lives. Um, and in the present day, I think we can all attest to that. We have some things to figure out. So workplace burnout is the core piece, but these elements that we'll talk about today and how you can apply and approach it, that extends to all of the different versions. So as you learn from things, think about is could burnout be impacting you in other forms of your life outside of the workplace? So as I talked about this, mitigate, or as I talked about this, I'm all about debunking burnout. So there's a lot of conversation, as I said. Uh, we went from a time where all of the hashtags on Instagram were burning tires to now all of a sudden there's all these motivational quotes um, when you look up hashtag burnout. So the world has been evolving and changing, um, but there's still some learning and growing we have to do. Uh, in this space. So burnout was coined in the set in 1970s, but and in 2019, it was actually deemed an occupational phenomenon. And now since 2020, it is a headline every single day, uh, as I get the Google alerts. So there's a lot of conversation, but our approach needs to be refreshed and reflect where we are today. One of the first things about the, the um, our debunking or our different approach is moving from a space of mitigate versus eradicate. So what do I mean by that? So when you look at the world of burnout, um, what we have to recognize is that burnout is a problem that has been here and it's not gonna go away by people returning to the office. And so for an org of about 500 employees, the average salary of 100K, burnout is creating a $13 million annual risk from disengagement alone. Disengagement, this does not include healthcare costs. This does not include recruiting as or, um, of retention issues or attrition. This does not include any of those other things. It only includes disengagement costs. So for those who may not have been convinced that burnout is a real problem that will continue to exist, feel free to take this picture, show them this one. I can give you the background data of it. It's not just going away and it's not so simple, but it doesn't mean we have to stay this way. Um, but based on our behavior right now and the way we're approaching it, we're not quite making as many as, as deep of a strider changes as one would think. Is it an all time high despite an increase in investments and focus? We're seeing the corporate wellness market care exploding um, as we're uh, with the increase of benefits and programs specifically in the mental health and wellness space. What's still interesting is that we're continuing to see lower single digit utilization rates of these benefits. And then we are seeing these continuation of high percentages of professionals dealing with burnout. This is the average professional, but in, when you look at millennial leaders, which are taking over the workplace and are your mid-level leaders, it's 85% of millennials alone. Um, if this is not a surprise to you, uh, can you give a sounds about right in the chat for me? If you're like, yep, Yep, not in my head. That's why we're here today. None of this is a surprise. Um, would love to see it in the chat. So <laughs> nodding of heads. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So what can we do differently about it um, where we are right now? So when you look at the past and how we've been approaching burnout, or shall I say not approaching burnout, it's really in a space of advocation. So it's sweeping it under the rug. And then since 2020, which I like to say is when we threw gasoline on these burning embers, now that we're talking about it in the present day, the conversation's about eradicating it. Let's just beat burnout, battle burnout, eliminate burnout, how to protect your company from ever dealing with burnout. If you are an organization or if you are an individual that has goals and wants to achieve and wants to do better and grow, Eliminate, completely eliminating burnout is not an actual realistic approach. I propose that we move to a mindset of mitigation. This is the future and how we can really do something about it. And as a new homeowner, I thought that it was ever so um, smart to use a pest control. So as you think about that, as you think about having a house or even if you have an apartment, the metaphor still holds, when it comes to mosquitoes, mosquitoes are seasonal. They are going to exist. And so when you get into a house, you're not like, oh my God, I wanna completely get rid of the mosquitoes. They will never ever come back. Just get in there, spray once and they are gone forever. That's just not how things work. And that's how we can approach burnout. It's more of a matter of mitigation. How are you going to 
maintain some type of upkeep and ongoing support to keep those things at bay. From a matter of pest control, that's when you get a, someone to come spray every 45 days or every couple of months. They come, they assess the situation, and then it's a matter of creating a tailored approach based on the situation which you're in. That is mitigation. That is a matter of a realistic approach to eliminating a risk or pest or some problem within your life. That is the same way in which we should be approaching burnout because it is not a one and done thing. Just because you do a virtual yoga class, which I feel like I don't have to convince anyone in this room today, one virtual yoga class is not gonna eliminate burnout. One hooky day is not gonna eliminate burnout. But how are you using those as part of your mitigation plan? How can you start to bring in those things throughout time to mitigate those symptoms as they start to flare up? That is the way we should be approaching it. So what does mitigation really look like in a workplace and even with yourselves? It's a matter of proactive and transparent expert support. If you have mosquitoes, you're not just getting bopped down the street to come down there and plug in uh, some type of sensor or the off thing. No, you call someone who is a vetted professional that works on these spaces that, can, that knows more than you know to help you take the best approach. And it is about proactive activity. And you can be proactive because you know that something will happen and it will flare up. That is the world we live in, that is burnout. If you are in a high stress environment, it will be a challenge. So what can you do? What things can you put in place to get ahead of it? Another big thing about mitigation is being optimistically real versus toxic positivity. Toxic positivity is a very real challenge um, in the world and in the workplace. That is when it's everything will be fine, everything will be great, nothing is wrong. But in actuality, some things are wrong. And even if you don't know the right answer uh, when it comes to your team or even for yourself or your organization, being transparent and honest and saying, we're not quite sure exactly what are the steps we're gonna take, but we are committed to researching this and to identifying a plan of how we move forward within the next three weeks. Communicating that even when you don't know helps to mitigate some of those extra symptoms that can flare up, the additional anxiety that will exist in the absence of knowing or when things are changing. So moving from a space which is very common in the workforce of toxic positivity because you have to look like you have it all together into optimistic realism where you can be honest and transparent with the team, that does wonders. Often overlooked because it is a common shift in how you talk about things that, that exist, but it can help to alleviate extra stress. That is my approach, that is what I'm all about. How do we alleviate, it, alleviate extra stress because real stress will exist. And then the last in mitigation is maintaining a level of situational awareness and continuing to have iteration of your approach. So when a situational awareness, a couple things to be aware of, and I'll just tell you, if you're taking notes, this is a good one. There are six known drivers of burnout in the workplace. The most common one is workload. Everyone thinks about that, it's just too much work. I'm gonna pause. Can anyone list in the chat any other thoughts on uh, the remaining five drivers of burnout? Someone might know it. <laughs> yes, Dane. Yes, it is. Anyone know any other drivers of burnout or just your thought? Lack of appreciation. Okay, thank you, Diana. All right, thank you, Diana. Okay, I will keep it pushing. So, uh, toxic, oh, toxic manager, schedule and security, lack of aligned purpose. All right, thank you. Um, those are. Unclear goals. <laughs> um, those are a number of things that can definitely feed into it. The proven drivers, as I said, workload, perceived control. Do you actually have control over how the work that you have to do can be done? Fairness, reward. A reward is a big one that's often overlooked or discounted. We think about, often people think about reward purely as a matter of financial reward and money. There are other ways in which people want to be rewarded. If you're a people manager or if you're an organizational leader, if that is not something that you have started to read up on or consider, that is a very big one and a low hanging fruit that is often overlooked because sometimes reward is purely a thank you um, and that can go a long way. But workload, fairness, reward, community is another big one, and values. 
do your values match the organizations and are, is everyone practicing what they preach? Um, workload, fairness, reward, values, community, and control. So those are your six known drivers of burnout in the workplace. So if you are dealing with burnout yourself or if your organization or team is um, having a very common experience, look at those things and think through them. Are those, some, are those different factors? How could they be a pro, a, impacting your team? If you know which ones are potential risk areas, you can take strategic and tailored action to combat those. So there's a little bit about the situational awareness with it. The next thing to matter of debunking is really about moving from a place uh, where collective is greater than the individual. That's a big one. Anyone who played team sports would understand. Uh, it's very, very important to work as a collective. I did doubles in tennis and also a basketball player. And if I was the only one on either of those courts, would not have done very well by myself. So in this space, when you look and if you, when you look, read and consider the space where we've been, everyone's pointing fingers at each other. I love this little meme. Companies are pointing at managers. Managers will fix it all. Individuals are pointing at the companies and the managers. Companies are pointing at the individuals. Like, this is all your problem. You need to just. The thing is, we can't point fingers at each other because we're just pointing at ourselves. When it comes to burnout, it is at three levels. So burnout is a result of systemic issues, collective behaviors, and individual uh, behavior as well. So at a systemic level, those are the systems, the structures, the process. So the whole idea of hustle culture, uh, the whole backlash around quiet quitting, or I shouldn't even say backlash, the whole idea and concept and use of the, those two words together, that is the sign of the systemic issues that exist. As quiet quitting is not quitting, it is doing your job and not using your discretionary effort for nothing. A collective, that's a matter of what are those norms and ways of working on a team and expectations. That's where it gets into, yeah, you can say that you respect people and their work-life balance, but if you or your leaders are sending emails and jumping on calls on their vacations, what expectation are you setting for the team? Do, I love to say, do as I say, not as I do, didn't work for children and it does not work in the workplace. So why do we continue to act as though it does? And then last but not least is a matter of the individual. So what behaviors, how are you managing your lifestyle? Are you empowered to practice your agency and are you actually doing it? You are the captain of your team. Remembering that and actually taking those tough steps sometimes to do it can be the hardest thing. And the thing is, we, there are levels to this. We need a comprehensive approach because it is a collective experience that is brought about by collective behavior. And so collective action is needed to change it. What does that look like? Coming at it with a tiered strategy. While I get excited about the number of benefits that are, have started to explode on the scene, if your benefits are over here, but only 30% of your employees know about it, what good does that do? If your managers are not actually walking the talk and illustrating the behavior that you want to permeate through your organization, how can your ICs ever believe you? How can you come at it from a tailored approach? What systems can you set up at an organizational level? How can you reinforce it from a matter of collective behavior? And how can you empower the individuals on your team to believe that they can take those steps and actually work towards prioritization of self and well-being? Doing this also requires and, and can call for shared experiences, accountability, and a bias for action. That all goes into it. It is not just on one person or one level in your organization. Managers are already tapped out. I'm sure that many of you can attest to this as well. Managers were already strained. So when organizations are saying, oh, just talk to your manager when you're feeling burned out, how do the managers have space? What other support systems are you putting in place for them to balance that extra weight and load as they are managing up, down, and in? How are we supporting all of those parts? And then creating a common vocabulary and understanding. While it is great when individuals go on and get uh, additional learning and development, it is a lot more powerful when we all share a collective vocabulary or common vocabulary and understanding, then we can take that, that collective action. Then we can hold each other accountable throughout this process as we are shifting and creating change. A thing that I like to remind people is that we talk so much about the future of work that we forget that we are building it right now. So giving yourself space and allowing yourself to take a collective approach and to realize you won't have all of the answers to start helps to breathe, give you a sigh, and realize we're all on the same page. I'm assuming a damn is a really good thing. Um, 
All right. So the third one, uh, the third area I like to debunk is that, yeah, burnout is common, but it is still unique. Burnout, as I said, now is very much getting greenwashed where I just roll my eyes as I literally just did right now, where it's so often I hear people saying, oh my God, I'm so burned out. Are you, or are you just tired or are you just stressed? Burnout has a very deep internal impact. And yes, some of those earlier stages a little lighter, but by just using it and in such a discounted flippant way, it does a disservice to those who have had a deeper experience with burnout. So a little bit more about it. And this is my approach. I like to take stuff and make it a little bit more comprehensive and easy to understand. I read the white paper so you don't have to. So when you read those white papers, you'll see that people talk about the burnout cycle in a number of different ways. There are stages, there are phases, there are dimensions, there are cycles. It depends on who you're talking to, which research and in what date. So I've distilled that down to make it easy because since 2020, we all wanna be plant parents. Uh, it makes it a little easy to understand. So this is how I like to talk about and approach the burnout cycle. Um, if you are a plant parent, can you say me in the chat? Any plant parents in here? And this is a new thing for me. I have one that has killed bamboo multiple times, but somehow I've kept a fiddle leaf fig alive for the past two years. Don't ask me how it looks though. All right, we got a couple plant parents. Uh, got a cactus, that's a good one. And for anyone who is like still scared to try plants, uh, it doesn't have to be a heavy investment. I like to get mine from Ikea. They're like $12. You can test it out and then you can go up to a bigger service and more expensive one. So, all right. So we got some plant parents. So we <laughs> plant murderers. I'm sorry, Tim, we'll get you some help. Um, all right. So when you look at this cycle, you can see it goes from thriving to needing to be replanted. Um, when you think about plants, we all understand things change. Different plants need different things. Uh, they can some days be wilting, some days they can be shriveling, dry. But the thing is, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means that there's some action that needs to be taken. That is the same way when you think about what happens in burnout in the cycle. So in the thriving, that's where the, the leaves are lush and green and, and shining and reflecting. Dry, from a plant standpoint, the, the, the soil literally might just be dry. Just give it some water to perk back up. Wilting, uh-oh, something is awry. Is it missing some water? Did it get in the sun too long? Is something else going on? You start to be a little bit more active uh, and um, surgical about what might be going on. Shriveling, you might be aligned, but you're like, I might be able to save it. It might require the shedding of some leaves and making things a little bit smaller. It might need some um, additional nutrition. It, there might be humidity, which I have learned is a thing when it comes to plants and I should care about. Maybe it's in the sun too long. And then there are some times when you're like, you know what, I just need to start over and to totally replant or repot it. But within this cycle, the thing is, this is what happens. This is what plants do. And that is the same thing when it comes to burnout in people. We could be anywhere in the cycle, and it doesn't mean that you are a failure. It means something's wrong with the situation. Something needs to change, and you might need to take a more surgical approach when you get into the point of wilting and tripling. So what that looks like from a human perspective, towards the left end, everything's great. You're, you're sleeping well, but once you start into getting into the dry stage, the first some, some of the first warning signs is literally exhaustion, and it's exhaustion from the matter of not, no matter how much sleep you get, you're still never quite uh, replenished. That is one of the first and biggest warning signs of burnout, as well as a number of other mental health and uh, wellness issues. So pay attention to your level of exhaustion. Are you tired or are you starting to get exhausted? That is a warning flag. So as you write down your notes, this is a very big thing that is often overlooked because people will say, I'll just get sleep later. Um, those are early signs, as well as pulling away from those things that can bring you joy and some of those basics. So are you eating less? Are you no longer working out? Are you deprioritizing those things that are actually stress relief valves for you? That is how it starts to manifest in the dry stage. Another big one in the workplace that happens is people work more. It's a slippery slope, sneaky, sneaky sucker in that early stage burnout, people are starting to produce less. So they double down on work because there's more work to do and I need to get it done. So I have to do more hours, but very quickly that can accelerate where you're putting in a lot more hours and producing less. 
That is one of the other big warning flags I like to call out because it is often overlooked. In this stage, in the earlier stages, people are saying, I'm fine, I'll get to it, things are good. But paying attention to, is it fine? Are you okay, but are you fine? Is something starting to be off? Pay attention and, and just monitor that. When you start to get into the wilting and the shriveling, this is where people start to get more cynical. Um, everyone is stupid is a very common one. No one can do their job. Nobody, like that is a common thing that I hear. So if you have coworkers or if you even find yourself saying, everybody sucks, no one knows how to do their job and you're doing saying that consistently about very different people or different teams, that's a warning sign that something else is off. It might be a matter of your situation needs to change, perspective needs to change, or there might be other stresses or limits on your bandwidth that you aren't recognizing. This is also where a lot of the coping mechanisms start to come in or, um, or negative coping mechanisms or false cures as they call it. So from a matter of a plant, it's like instead of giving them water, we're giving them booze. Um, well, who knows, a plant might perk up in that, but uh, that is not often the good, that is not the solution that is needed at that time. Um, but false cures is another big one. Cynicism starts to get into that middle stages. The last stage is the piece about burnout where is often overlooked and where I, I, I think we do a disservice when we discount it or sugarcoat it. Being in the replanting stage is very serious. That is where it can be an internal sense of emptiness of everything is for naught. You wasted your time. Why did you even get this degree? You don't know what you wanna do with your life. Those are often the feelings of, I feel like a failure is a very common phrase, or I should have known. Those are situations that can accelerate or trigger other mental health, me, mental health and physical ailments. Um, it increases the propensity of physical ailments. Um, and depression, acute depression is something that can pop up. Acute versus chronic, acute depression, just so we know, is possible. It is when you have a sense of emptiness or sadness, though you can still find joy in other parts of life. Uh, often it's overlooked because people say, I'm not completely depressed, this makes me happy. But if you are finding complete um, elimination of joy in certain parts of your life, that is a sign of a later stage. Another uh, big thing that is often overlooked, but I like to point out is PTSD like symptoms from the workplace are real. As someone who has been there, done that, doesn't want to go again, uh, I like to bring awareness to it. So for me, how that shows showed up and how I've seen it in a lot of clients is, does your body tense up when you hear your outlook? My stomach used to drop when I would hear my outlook. It always had to be on silent. If you're in a meeting, do you find that as someone who might've been front and center, you are pulling back now, you no longer want to engage with anyone around you. Is your, are you actually feeling body tension um, when you are in certain environments, in certain meetings, around certain people? Those type of things are very real and can be tied to the workplace, often overlooked, and people believe that it's only in their mind. And then the last one that is often overlooked is cognitive fog. For those knowledge workers like yourself, this is huge because what I often see and hear from people is saying, I feel stupid. I feel like I'm getting stupid. Cognitive fog is real. It is something where your brain is cloudy and you're no longer able to do the things that you do as quickly, efficiently, or as easily as you may be used to. Those are all very real things. And when it comes to especially those later stage symptoms and signs, the number one thing I recommend uh, is getting a mental health guide or a therapist to support you because those are things that are a little bit deeper and require some additional support. If you don't have a therapist, you don't know if you want to get one, if you're apprehensive, what you can do is start with introspection and journaling. I recommend that wherever you are. That is something that at first I thought was woo-woo and extra, but journaling allows you to process some of your emotions and feelings so that you can recognize, so that you can do something about it. So those are that's a, a very quick overview of the cycle. Um, I wanted to share it, though I can't get all the way into the weeds like I do in other sessions, but hopefully this helps to really conceptualize some of these things for you. And as you can see, it is very robust. It is not just one and done. It does not look the same for everyone. And even the same person, different burnout episodes can look slightly different. People do not have to go through every single stage in a, in a sequential way. People can hop in a matter of recognition, as well as it can affect you differently depending upon where you are that day. So it's, I guess it's no surprise seeing that this is a new conversation when studies show over 80% of people don't know what to do to beat burnout. And when it comes to looking at benefits and resources, people are often overwhelmed uh, by the time they recognize it and recognize that they can or should take some action, 
That is why we continue to see such single digit utilization rates. And the thing that grinds my gears the most is that benefits, even as simple as taking time off, continue to go unused. In 2018, 768 million unused vacation days in the US. Do you know what I could do with that time? My goodness. And more than half of those were actually just dropped and didn't even roll over. This has continued to be an issue. And so a recent study by Glassdoor show, showed that even though people may now start be, uh, paying attention to their PTO as organizations are getting to a place of unlimited, over 50% of people are saying they don't know how to unplug on vacation. Often it has to do with waiting so late into the cycle that we are overwhelmed, but then we also don't have bandwidth to plan and to support. So those are just some things of creating some urgency is that it's not all the same for everyone. And there are things that we need to start doing and utilizing your benefits. So if there's anyone on here that is, does not have time to take a day off, let's talk. This is my time to tell you, yes, you do. And if nothing else, talk about an action. As uh, Kenny said, what are your actions? Look at your calendar in the next three months and find your hooky day. Um, and I'll send that you will get resources because uh, our annual hooky day is in October and I have resources and support to help you for that day. So all you have to do is take the day off and I'll help you with the rest. So personalized support, more about that. What are ranges of options that you have for your team or for yourself to support you at work and home? How can you ensure that this support is approachable and is clear and is frictionless? Nothing is worse than having the support add more stress. That is often what is happening in the workplace. Uh, as people are saying, I just don't have time to figure out what support I need. It's overwhelming. And it's in one of those emails from HR. If you have benefits in your organization and you're like, yeah, I don't have time either. A little trick, create a folder in your, in your Outlook or whichever system you have. All of those emails that come from HR that have to do with benefits, just put them in there. That way, at least you know where to start when you actually want to look into it. Nothing is worse than having to go through thousands of emails like, what's that one from HR? Uh, so that is all about a personalized approach. So that's it. Quit, uh, just a quick three things about debunking. So one is moving from a mindset of mitigate versus eradicate. Um, one is another is coming at it from a collective versus an individual approach. And last but not least is recognizing and understanding that burnout is very common, but it is still unique. So ensuring that you have diversified support that is simple and clear that your employees and you yourself can use. So a couple last things. So as you said, um, I have a company called Hooky Wellness. We're all about taking the burden out of burnout because it's hard enough as it is. So if you yourself or if your organization are looking to really equip your team with additional support, we work in the space of working wellness. I call it work wellness in that gray area in between. We specialize there, which is working wellness um, because work, the life is not siloed or fractured as we like to approach it. Um, also, we are all about approachable, practical and action oriented support. Um, a recent workshop I actually did with the Microsoft Windows team was really exciting. I did a special workshop, uh, Burnout Relief with a Twist, because if we are going to have to do development, it should be fun. Um, I use a mocktail making experience for team wellness, development, learning, and uh, education. So if you are wondering about support and you're like, I need something that is action, I don't like to waste money or time, neither do I. Nice to meet you. Um, so my support programs are all about really imparting action and awareness that people can start with today and tomorrow. So what are those steps that they can walk out of? How can we equip the teams to have a deeper level of conversation, understanding and personal empowerment to do something different? Well, as I said, we're creating the future of work and we have to start today because if you didn't know, things are not totally fine. Um, so uh, I will be sending a note with uh, Kenny with some additional resources, but you can always reach out to me, visit Hooky Wellness, shoot me an email, learn more about support for your team. And I will be sending a resource guide, which is my burnout bingo tool. Um, step one is understanding what's going on and getting the language. So if you are like, all right, I hear it. I wanna get ahead of it, but I don't know what's going on. This can give you some of that language to start. Um, so those are the ends of my slides. I see Kenny's face back up here and now we're gonna open it up for Q and A. You got it. So yeah, we're opening back up from Q&A. Do you see Dane's question here, Reina? So much of this is based on doing the right thing for your team. What does one do when their uplines, um, uplines doesn't share that sense, that same sense of what's right? Mm. And I assume uplines is senior leadership? I think so. 
Okay. That is a really great question. Awesome. And very often the case. So in a perfect situation, all three of those levels are taking action at the same time. We're all holding hands. We're moving in the same direction. We're on the same page. But that is not often the world that we live in. So if your uplines don't necessarily match the same mindset, what do they care about? What does matter to them and what matters to you? So there are a couple different ways in which it could be. It could be a matter of they care, but they don't recognize the business case and they just don't have the space to take action. Okay, so you in the role that you are in, if you are a people manager, you're a people manager, you have a team. So how can you start to embed these behaviors into your team in a way that still reflects and the, the organization's goals and values? So that can be anywhere from as simple as you taking your vacation and utilizing your benefits, talking about it with your team, and then making it part of their development track. How can you reinforce those simple type of behaviors in it every day? You have benefits, the organization gives you the benefits, you're ensuring that they use it. So actually you're helping them with their utilization rates. You're welcome benefits team. Um, at a deeper level, how can you change some of those workplace dynamics and ways of working? You can increase communication, you can increase transparency, clarify scope or responsibility. Those are things that as a manager, we should be doing all the time, but we often don't recognize how much of an impact that has on mitigating burnout symptoms. A lack of awareness, scope creep, changing direction, uh, cracking the whip where people are going back and forth on their objectives, those type of things drive burnout, contribute to burnout, and those are things that are within your perimeter of control. From a larger sense, if it's a matter of, oh, we really do want to create a wellness week like a LinkedIn, yeah, you do need higher level system structural organization to do something like that, but there are smaller everyday behaviors. Um, another one, if you're taking vacation, take your vacation and do not jump on that call. If you are sending emails, do not send emails after 8 p.m. or on the weekend. If that is a behavior that you do and it's hard for you to stop it, don't pass your stress forward. Schedule it so those emails go out during work hours. So even if it's hard for you to start to stop completely change your behavior, you can still illustrate a different behavior for your team. So hopefully that type of stuff was helpful, but just because senior leadership may not completely embrace everything doesn't mean you can't. And if, but there is a difference if your senior leadership is actually impeding people's well-being or a problem that might be a, a, a bigger flag and a conversation of, is this the right organization for you? So thinking about your personal values and how those complement or compete with the organization, that might open a door that you may not have expected and may not love to have, but it may be a sign that something else is going on. Everybody doesn't deserve you and every organization isn't ready. I've had a client, an almost client that asked me during, um, a debrief or discovery call, if there was a way to weed out those who were more likely to deal with burnout during the interview process. And I didn't work with them. Uh, that is not the right mindset because burnout happens in to everyone or can happen to everyone. And it does happen, especially in those high performance environments. So you might have a sign that that's not the right place for you to work. Thank you, Dane, for uh, breaking the ice. And thank you, Brandon, for asking that. Um, we're going to take two more questions here. Uh, one is from Lauren um, Siegel. How can leadership in a smaller company be a better model for their teams when it feels like the work just keeps coming? Because <laughs> the work will just keep coming. Um, okay. Especially if you're in a growing organization, the work will keep coming. Like, let's be real. I'm an MBA. I worked at Nestle. I worked it into it. Work's not going to stop. What you can do in smaller companies, bigger companies, the biggest thing is make sure that the work that people are doing is the work that matters. That matters to you and it matters to them. The thing that has happened over the past couple of years is that bandwidth has changed. We never had 120% bandwidth because that's not realistic or a real number, but we can't even act like we have 120%. Think about it. We are all running on almost fumes. Your bandwidth is being used in different ways. So it is extremely important for people to focus on the things that matter. That is where the whole conversation of quiet quitting comes in because it's not quitting. They're just doing their job. So take out the extra. Can you eliminate fire drills? Fire drills should be abnormal, not a norm of behavior. So can you buffer? And it is a little bit more work for managers, so apologies on that, but it also should eliminate some of that headache for you. 
ask those clarifying questions. Because remember Puerto's principle, 80% 80, uh, 80 of what you get is from the 20% of work. So how can you start to embed that and employ that? It will take some changing behavior. So pick one of those things that might be a thorn in your side to get your feet wet and to start practicing this new thing. Um, but that is how you can help, whether it's a small company or big company, is make sure you're focusing on the work that matters and the rest of it can wait. Mm. I think um, that's one of those snap moments. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you two more that we can uh, go ahead and get some time back. One is from Diana Barnes here. Can you share the data behind the statistics used here? Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know which one specifically, but um, yeah. Can you all put that in some of the after action? Cool. Cool. Yeah. Diana, go be a little bit, just a little bit more specific about any data points that you might have saw. Uh, that, that would help out. Uh, but Tracy here, going to you next here. Do you have tips on how to retain yourself, retrain yourself, and actually take real time off when the work just keeps coming? Yes. Uh, you can say your burnout expert told you you have to go on timeout. Um, I treat you like my therapist did. So uh, retraining yourself is real. And it, it's one, there's a couple steps in it. One is to take the action and to declare that you're going to do it. So the very first step, look at your calendar, block that day. Pick your next hooky day, put it on the calendar in advance. It will be a nice surprise for you. And you can no longer put it off and say, I was going to do it, but someone took that day and now I can't, blah, blah, blah. So put it on there, block that day off. You'll figure out what to do later. Um, when it comes to that, uh, other ways that you can help retrain is getting an accountability partner. You're not the only one that feels this way. So whether it's your office BFF or one of your friends, they need a break too. So how can you hold each other accountable to do that in advance and give yourself something to look forward to? Um, then it's a matter of, are you prepared to take that day off? I actually have an article coming out soon about getting through the guilt of taking it because guilt comes up. Um, do what you do, figure out what needs to be done, make sure you did it, then you can breathe more. And it's not a matter of, did I get that done? Are they going to feel like I'm slacking? Is this person going to be waiting on me? If you're only taking a day, it's one day. Would you still feel this way if you had to go to the doctor? Would you still have that level of guilt? Would you still feel that way if you were doing something else? So one is a matter of giving yourself that space and recognizing this is not something that you have to deserve or earn. It is a literally part of your package. And then two is making sure that the work that needs to be done in order for your team to continue to move forward is that. Um, so those are other resources and some of these things. We can talk offline because that's some of the programming and training that we have, but those are a couple quick things to do. Um, put it on your calendar in advance just to block the time and reserve the time for yourself and then figure out what needs to be done so things can keep moving while you're out. It's not going to stop just because you're not there. They will still have the meetings. And if you tell them what your point of view is, hey, this is what is important to me. This needs to keep moving. The work can continue to push forward. Awesome. Yeah. If you don't yes. have time, it's not a commitment. Agreed. I also think like when people will say like, you know, I get asked a lot, like, how do you do so many different things? And I tell them, you know, funny enough, I have the same amount of hours in a day as I had when I was first born. That doesn't change. You just got to say no much faster. And because you say no so many times to say yes to the real thing. And I find like burnout does come from being obsessed with saying yes so much because eventually there's only so many things you can do, right? Like everyone has 168 hours in the week. So, you know, this is such a good reminder of that. Last point here, then like, you know, everyone can go. Um, Diana says, thank you. Mostly the 13 million in disengagement and the 80% of people unsure of what to do about burnout. Okay. Where did that data come from? Yep, I'll send it through. So the disengagement piece, uh, that was actually some SHRM numbers for a matter of the disengagement. And then I calculated it based on it. So it's 34% of a person's salary um, is the cost of burnout for their disengagement alone. And so oh. I just extrapolated it. Yeah it's, like insane. yeah, it's insane. Well, thank you, Arena, so much. We're going to end on time. Uh, appreciate everyone asking the great questions as well. Uh, can, can you give your email one more time in the chat in case people want to reach out? Absolutely. I would love to chat. Um, it is Irena at hookywellness.com. And once again, I am on Instagram as Burnout Whisper. Um, you can DM me. You can send me an email. You can send me questions. Um, if this is support. I support um, ERGs, workplace teams, benefits teams, uh, as well as individuals have some exciting stuff coming. So shoot me a note if I can help or if there's a resource you're looking for, I will do my best to help you with it. Perfect. 
All right, y'all. Be good. Stay tuned for the next TSC webinar. Thank you so much, Arena. You crushed it today. Thank Let's you. go. Take care. Bye, everybody.